Get Lost in Jersey with Rachel and Jeanette talking about life just outside New York City. Let's get started. Jeanette, yes. today's interview is amazing. Right. I feel so grateful that you're friends with her. Kate Zernike is a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter. For explanatory reporting yep. about the stories of Al-Qaeda before and after the 9-11 terror attacks. Yes. And she uh, is a reporter, for a national reporter for the New York Times. Mm -hmm. And she also uh, was a reporter for the Boston Globe when she first got an idea about this and wrote yeah, the, she first the, broke the story about this and MIT mm -hmm. is called the exceptions, Nancy Hopkins, MIT and the fight for women in science. Inter Intercover says that in 1999, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology admitted to discriminating against its most senior female scientist. It was a seismic cultural event one that forced institutions across the nation to reckon with the bias faced by girls and women in STEM. It isn't just about science. It is universal and an American story. And it's out now everywhere. Stick around to the end where she discusses how she became interested in becoming a journalist and really deep diving into people's lives and stories. But that, here is Kate Zernicki. Hi. Hi. Hey, Kate. <laughs> Kate, thank you for being on here and coming on and talking about your book. And I downloaded it for and started listening to it. Then I got the book. Oh. So there it is. And, mm -hmm. I, and I'm proud to say that I finished it yesterday. And you posted notes in there. I'm very impressed. Oh, Kate. Oh, my God. <laughs> Look at all of her post-it notes. <laughs> There are so many posters. They're color coordinated. You've got yellow, bright yellow poster notes to color coordinate with the title on my book. I love that. Oh yeah, I know. I, I, it's pretty incredible. I went out and bought them specifically for that. Yeah. And mean, also yeah. for Dion's ah. book too. That's in the back there. You see. Yeah. Oh yeah. So you've been on a quite a tour of. Uh, I mean, do you, have you counted how many? Like, do you know how many interviews? Interviews in, in like. I haven't. I could count. It's funny. A friend of mine who's written um, three books, maybe four, actually five, um, said to me, oh, my God, your publisher's sending out an eight city tour. I can't believe that's nobody does that anymore. And, and then I was like, oh, is it eight? And then I counted. I was like, actually, it's more than eight. So, um, so I, yeah, I've been around a lot. I started in New York at Symphony Space. And then I was at the Brattle Theater in Cambridge, which is you know where the book is based. Um, I spent a week in California going to various bookstores and Google and Livermore National Labs. It was really fun. And then I'm trying to think last night I was in Greenwich, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So I'm going to, uh, I was in Atlanta. Um, yeah. It's been fun. It's been really been traveling it's a, lot a lot of fun. Yeah. 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 And I've loved talking about the book. I mean, there's always the danger that you spend all these years writing the book and then you're like, I'm so sick of this. I cannot talk about it anymore, but I've, the audiences have been really interesting and really engaged and, have taught me things. It's just been a wonderful conversation. I'm sure do a lot of audience members come up and want to share their story. With yeah. Or they people. raise their hands and want to share yeah. their story. Um, and last night it was funny last night in Greenwich, um, all female audience, except for the bookstore co-owner, who's a man um, and who had gone to MIT. Um, but the, there was one woman who was there with her 12 year old daughter. And she was like, I think I forget what she had worked in. Oh, she had worked in, I think she worked in finance. She'd um, finance biotech companies. And she was like, are you going to do other industries? Like, if you thought about writing books about every other industry? And I was like, it would take a long time. Cause I do, you know, I hear from lawyers, I hear from bankers, I hear from doctors, I hear from, you know, a friend in the travel industry, like just, you know, I hear from journalists, like when you yes. hear them. And so it's not that, um, I think initially, maybe I worry sometimes about having science in the subtitle of the book. I know because it's, it's universal. This is this is in every Absolutely. single industry. Yes, and yes. so I we were we had a lot of discussions, my editor and I, about um, what the subtitle should be, and it, you know, it was like how do we get everything in there? And and I said I'm just joking. I was like, this should be called the exceptions a universal story because I really did mm -hmm. feel like mm -hmm. as much as it is like oh these are you know yep. exceptions is like suggests like it's a one off. <laughs> But no, this is everybody. So it is everybody in the book. When I was reading it, like 1992, this is like 1992, mm -hmm. and I'm like, okay, I started working in '94, yeah. so it feels exactly the same. Yeah. Although I will say, you know, the book, 
um, because it's about this woman, Nancy Hopkins, and she um, graduates from college in 1964. So I spent a lot of time in the in the first part of the book about, you know, the early 60s. And what strikes me is, so yes, yeah, so much has changed, but also so much that hasn't, right? So I think, I do think there's, there's hope and promise in the book as well. Oh, um, yeah. Do you want to maybe give us a little bit of a, I know it's hard to give a highlight of the book, but yeah, for no, people who yeah. haven't read it yet. Yeah. So The Exceptions, it's called The Exceptions, Nancy Hopkins, MIT, and the Fight for Women in Science. Uh, and it's about, it's based... Um, it starts with a story that I wrote for the Boston Globe that I broke as a Boston Globe reporter covering higher education in 1999. And uh, in 1999, MIT acknowledged that it had discriminated against its female faculty or female scientists on its faculty. Um, and I was really, you know, I was really struck by the story. The story took off incredibly. You know, the story was picked up by the you know national TV broadcasts, radio in other countries. Um, the New York Times, my story ran on the front page of the Boston Globe on a Sunday. The New York Times put it on its front page on the Tuesday. And at that point, women from all over the world were literally all over the world were writing to Nancy and the other women at MIT and saying, oh, my God, this is my story. I thought I was the only one who was ex- who would experience this. So the book takes us back to Nancy when she's a college junior in 1963. And she um, is struggling to figure out what to do with her life. And she feels like because of the pressures on women at that time, she feels like she has to, um, she has until 30 when she knows she has to like have her kids. And she's already figured, you know, she has the guy, she's going to marry him, but she has until 30 until she's going to have kids. And she feels like, but I have to do something really, really important in those (laughs) 10 years. I love that. It's so methodical and well-planned, just like a scientist. Yes, exactly. Just like a scientist. (laughs) And so she goes to this one hour biology lecture taught by James Watson, four months after he and Francis Crick have won the Nobel prize for decoding the structure of DNA. And she just falls in love with the idea of DNA and genetics. Um, and she decides she's, this is what she's going to do. This is going to be her big, important thing. And then she's going to quit and have kids. So 10 years later, she's gotten married and she's gotten divorced because she figures out that, you know, as all the things she thought were going to happen with family and kids were not compatible with science. Um, and she's really, you know, she, she sort of struggles with this, what she calls a love triangle between her husband and science and her. Um, but she gets hired at MIT. She's one of the first women hired there. And she thinks that science is a pure meritocracy and the doors are open for women. And that's all that matters. She's not a feminist. She's like, I'm just going to do my science. Maybe I'll win a Nobel prize. Cause I'm totally devoted to this. And I like to say, you know, the book is how, you know, Nancy gets schooled of that idea, right? Like life <laughs> schools her that this is not a meritocracy. And in fact, there's no such thing as meritocracy. Exactly. Well, that's, that's wonderful. The way you just explained it. I was just struck by how thorough your investigation and your reporting was in this book, but yet it's, It still reads like a novel in parts where it's conversational. You're drawn into this character of Nancy. And I felt like I was sitting in the lecture hall with her, with Watson. And then also you describe when then she met Crick. Yep. (laughs) And how awful that situation was with him. And whoa, it's like a great wake up. Like you're like, yes, it's going to work. It's all going to work out. I totally believe it. No, it's not. Yeah. Because Francis Crick is behind you and his hands are on your breast. Yes. Yeah. Um, Asking you, how's it going? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) What are you working on? But but what's so striking to me about that scene is that Nancy herself is like, you know, this, she's like, she's, she's embarrassed for him. She's like, oh my God, how do I make him feel comfortable? Right. Like it wasn't like, this is an outrage. No, Um, it's not like she's going to go to HR and, and it's like, all right, that's unfortunate. Let's just move on. Right. And so what what was so striking, so she finally comes together at the end of the book to, with these other women, and they all kind of, as they begin to just talk about it, they all say like, this is, this is the kind of thing they were all putting up with because they all thought that they were the only ones going through mm-hmm. it. So yeah, I mean, I think Nancy starts out thinking like, I can, I can plow through and I can get through any of this stuff. And that's one of the reasons that that I wanted to come back to this story in 2018. Mm-hmm. You know, I was just watching me, the Me Too movement happen, right? And I was, you know, Obviously, so much has changed, and the fact that we could that women felt they could speak up in Me Too was important. But it struck me that that was actually like a narrow slice of the problem, you know, sort of the egregious sexual assault, and that really the the bigger problem was what these women had talked about, which was like over the course of their career, they're just kind of marginalized and kept out, um, and they don't even see it happen for themselves, right? But and I, also, that's the culture that allows those egregious sexual assaults yeah. to happen. Right. Because at the fundamental level, we're not taking women seriously. Yes. And so when you say like, when you say the book is like a novel, that 
is what I wanted to do because at the you know at the time when these women in 1999 when the MIT report happened or came out nobody was talking about unconscious bias at the time right. now we're talking about it so much that people don't hear it anymore and so I was I feel like people I think they they don't hear it and they don't think it really exists they think it's like something that we've dealt with and we mm-hmm. had I had the HR training um so I wanted to tell the story in a very up close way so that people through the character of Nancy would be like, oh, this is what it feels like. And that they would realize that this is not something we have cured like this. And, you know, this is how it happens. And this is how we excuse it over the years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, um, one thing about the book is in 1999, when they when you get the story at the Globe yeah. and you make the call back and this unfolds, the story that happens. Something that I've heard in an interview that you've done with Nancy and also throughout the book, the title of the book, Exceptions, is that she never really thought she was being discriminated against or overtly, you know, she kind of saw it, thought maybe, you know, it was personality and maybe that person was a little bit difficult to work with and how she was kind of surprised at, at the end that she's one of these, she wasn't like a feminist you no, know, you know, all. she wasn't and she was just doing her work and kind of seeing a little bit of, you know, discrimination here and there, but kind of found an excuse for it kind of in a way or uh, a, a reason for it. And, you know, how she became a watershed figure. And, in, 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 you know, I know that before they had movements that had tried, but because this is MIT and the, the president of MIT kind right. of finally got it and it got it, the story out to you that it changed everything. When you got it, did you yourself think you were an exception? Did you, when you Mm -hmm. heard the story, because I, when you talk about Me Too, when I, Me Too happened, I finally started to try to examine more Mm -hmm. about my career path and thinking, well, yeah, maybe, you know, I do remember, because, but I didn't, I thought it was, I thought it was very successful in a men's world and didn't think I had, and because you were a reporter at the Globe, you have you are as extraordinary an individual as the people in the book. I mean, you are a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, reporting author. Did you feel that you were an exception? I love what you say about 2018, because I think I had the same thing. We all did, right? We all thought yeah. well, that happened to me because I didn't have, I mean, with, you know, maybe some things that were borderline, but I didn't, you know, thankfully I didn't have like what Nancy, I didn't have a colleague try to, you know, sexually assault me, but yeah, but you start to think about the subtle things. That the subtle happened, one, right? Yeah, and, subtle. and that's, and I, that's what I wanted people to sort of pay attention to because I, we've seen these movements come and go and we think that they fix things and they don't fix things because we're not talking about the underlying problem, which is that we don't take women fully seriously. You know, there's still, we are still second class citizens on a certain level. Did I feel like an exception? Um, I think when I wrote the, and I talk about this in the prologue, I talk talk about my mom's experience, right? So my mom wanted to go to law school when she graduated from college in 1954 and was told, you know, don't go because you'll never get a job. And my mother, you know, like Nancy said, like agreed with this and said she got it. Um, But she had gone back to law school when I was seven in the the mid seventies. So I kind of thought, as Nancy did, the doors were open. And so mm-hmm. here I had this job at the Boston Globe. I was really happy. I had a, you know, I had, I'd been hired by someone who was a real mentor to me, um, continues to be to this day, who was a man. And I like, it didn't, I think I was watchful. I wasn't, I didn't think like, oh, I'm the exception. I didn't think like, oh, I got this. Um, these, but these women made me a little more watchful. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think I didn't, I I didn't feel like the exception because I saw other women around me and I knew I was working hard. I did have the sense like Nancy did that as long as I worked hard, that would be everything. And I think what happened is, and that that it wouldn't matter. Um, I think as I, so then I moved to New York a year later in 2000 to write for the times. And I think definitely as I got into my career, I saw more of this. And certainly when I had kids, I saw more of this and then it was, yeah you know, oh, well, wait, I'm not getting the same kind of assignments. Or even before I had kids, I remember I interviewed for a job covering the Pentagon and the person who was interviewing said, well, you know, it was, it was the middle of the Iraq war right after Fallujah. And so he said, well, you, you do know that if you took this beat, you'd have to go to Iraq. And I was like, yeah, I, I get it. And I just wondered, like, <laughs> did he ask the guy who ultimately got yeah, that? Yeah. Yeah. Did he ask him the same question? Um, but when I had kids, it was like, suddenly there was this assumption that like people would say to me, oh, I figured I just assumed you didn't want that job or um, 
or mm-hmm. well, like I remember once I've told this story, but like I was in um, St. Louis covering the pre- the vice presidential debate uh, with Sarah Palin. I was following Palin around uh, around the country on her campaign, and I was um, I was frustrated because my stories I would write stories and they would get reduced to like paragraphs in the stories written about the McCain campaign. And I wasn't sure whether this was because of how we saw Palin or whether it was because it was me, but I asked an editor, I finally asked an editor and he said, you know, I wondered about that. Um, So I asked, and he told me who he asked and he said, I was told you couldn't travel. And I was like, I am in St. Louis with you right now. (laughs) And it was like, you know, and my husband, you know, when we had kids, my husband changed jobs. He'd been working, he was a doctor and he'd been working in a hospital and he had really long hours and he went into private industry because we felt that hours there would be more flexible. Um, we hired a full-time nanny. Like I really had gone to great lengths to not have, have child rearing disrupt my career. And it was like, I hadn't counted on the ways in which attitudes about child rearing would disrupt my career. It wasn't just having children. I do think, I do think there's just, there are just different assumptions about what women can do. You know, 100%. I, I remember I was working at a tech startup. I mean, it's probably in the late nineties yeah. and um, then 2000. And then um, I got engaged and mm-hmm. I didn't tell anybody. I mean, I told like the guys that I was friends with that like were in the server room turning orange because they saw no daylight and they only ate Doritos. Yeah. Right. But like, <laughs> I definitely, you know, it was I'm not going to tell my boss or anything. Later that day, I got a call from my superior. He said, please meet me in my office. Ooh. Uh-oh. And I said, okay, he closed the door. He had a whiteboard up and he says, I heard you got engaged. And I said, uh, yes, like this is not a business meeting. I, oh. I didn't, I was so flabbergasted. <clears throat> he took the marker and he said, your career is here. It could go up here, but now it's going to, and he just drew You're it kidding me. down off the thing. And I said, excuse me. He goes, yeah, you just ruined it. Oh, really? Yeah, there's something um, that almost feels like a, a bizarre come on in some way. Like, yeah, you it was you should continue to play around with me, baby. I mean, my God, it really? was it had a sexual undertone. Yes, it had. Absolutely. I didn't even know what to do. I just I didn't get out of that room. My well, God. So I looked at him and I said, I am still the same person. I still am an engineer. I can still do this job. I'm mm. you like I was just promoted recently. Are yeah. you kidding me? He goes, yeah, but that you hit the top. You're going to just have babies. And that's that. I said, I'm going to go. And I don't know how I got the guts to do that. Cause I was also thinking my mom broke a lot of glass ceilings in her yeah. career. Yep. And I'm like, it's done. There's no glass ceiling. I'm going to just, yeah. I can have it all. That's what we were all sold. Yep. And, um, I just thought I'm going to just keep my head down. I did not go to HR. I mean, yeah. I Nobody never went that. to HR for Nobody any, because yeah. you don't want to be tagged as difficult, right? Right. Yeah. So I, I somehow got out of that room and, Ugh. and then eventually I did leave that job yeah. because I was like, this is, I'm not staying That's in this. Unsustainable. Yeah. But you know, that, that is, a, that's also a thread through your book is mm-hmm. about the people who are in management and who are, you know, deans who are in charge matter, you know, it matters. Oh so yeah. Much. It sets the tone. And even if there's progress, the next one might reverse it, you know, right. it's exactly. Yes. In Iceland, as we were talking on the last interview, they they have a mentality that it's both the man and the woman yes. that are going to be raising a child, you know, and it's mandatory for you to take a paternity. I also th- yes. And I so I also think, though, that the part of the problem with this and when I talk when we're talking about women here, like you could apply this to any underrepresented group. But when we yes. talk about solutions for this, um it's always played as like a zero sum game. So it's Mm -hmm. against men. Like last night I spoke to this audience in Greenwich and I was like, really? Like not a single guy. And you know, like this is like a woman's problem and, and that, that, that any solutions are going to be at the expense of men. And the reality is like, I actually think men want some of these changes in the workplace and, you know, men want to spend more time with their families too. Like, Absolutely. I think, you know, we want this flexibility. I do think that's something that we've seen through, you know, pandemic has helped us realize that men, mm-hmm. you know, oh, men were like, oh, this, like having a little flexibility, I could go for a run at noon or whatever. I mean, and not every job is like that, but that you could think about the work world in a different way, I think is like starting yeah. for men. Um, but what's so, what was so striking to me about the research for this book and you know, you always get, as a writer, you go on these sort of like rabbit hole journeys, right? So I was looking for, I was trying to figure out how many, um, 
how many women and how many men, how many female and male students were in that first lecture with Nancy, the, the Watson lecture that she goes to in 1963. Mm-hmm. And so I was like looking at all these different archives, like at the Cold Spring Harbor Labs, which is where Watson went and mm-hmm. at Harvard and Radcliffe. So then I came across this just incredible archive of stuff at Radcliffe, including um, Nancy's 1964 yearbook. But what's so interesting is in the yearbook, there the women, the writer, the um, editors of the yearbook are writing these essays that really reflected on where they thought of themselves in life, right? And so this is a year after Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique comes out. But these young women are like, that is speaking to our mother's generation. We don't need that. Mm-hmm. We are like, but they don't want to be, they don't want to call themselves feminists because they think a feminist is like the suffragist, you know, chain, chain themselves mm-hmm. to lampposts to get the right to vote. They're like, our, our, the men will respect us. We're going to be able to have families and careers. Like, we got this. And it just strikes me the number of times, like, I wasn't even born then, but the number of times that I've read that story in my life. Like, every generation thinks we've solved the problem. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, and then we, and then it's like, oh my God, wait, we discovered it anew. I mean, I kind of can't believe that story that you told. But then at the same time, I, you know, so I find this 19, 1964 yearbook. I also went back and read the coverage of when Larry Summers is president of Harvard mm-hmm. um, said in a, in a quite a small conference on. I remember Not, that. Right. So he said, unbelievable. He said, first he says women, he's trying to explain why they're not women <laughs> at higher levels of math and science. And the first thing he says is, and Nancy's in the room, by the way, my character, mm-hmm. Nancy Hopkins, um, Nancy's in the room and he says, the first thing he says that pisses her off is, well, women don't want to work 80 hour weeks. And she's like, I've been working 80 hour weeks my entire life. And then he says, women, I think, you know, if you look at math scores, women lack the intrinsic aptitude to do math and science at the highest levels. And at this point, she pushes back her chair very deliberately. It's not a big group. And she gets up and she walks out and she says, tells this to a reporter and she's just mad. But to look at the coverage of the response to that story now, you know, 15 years later, or more, you know, what do you, 18 years later, um, people rushed to the defense of Larry Summers. They were like, uh-huh. well, he was just raising. It's out of context or yes, it's at raising. Exactly, right, right. But that also goes to highlight that the burden uh, to create change always falls on the underrepresented yes. um, group. And that's what we're seeing here also today with Black Lives Matter. Like, why um, do you know, minorities have to constantly explain why it isn't yeah. fair. And I mean, that's the burden on them to create all the data, get it all together, these women, then present it, be meticulous, yeah. make sure that they can have the proof that right. they are being discriminated against and yeah. then present it. it. That's what infuriates me. Yeah. I mean, yeah. In general. I mean, I will say um, that I think we kind of have to like, that's, I, I say this when I go around, cause I get young women asking me like, what can I do? And I will say like, you know, this is kind of the reality. Like you got to work within the system. I think sometimes like, you know, I've been covering abortion for the times and um, I've talked to men who say like, well, I just feel like it's not my position to speak up about this. And so we have to say to them like, no, actually it is your position to speak up about this. It's okay for you to talk about this. And in fact, we want you to talk about this. Yes, that's- please. Right. But like, One thing, you know, in the book, the women, they go to the dean of science and he, you know, he's inclined to think there's no discrimination. But then he sees these like the stories they tell him there's six women in a room with him and they tell him their stories one after the other. And he's like, oh, my God, like we have a problem. And he says, you know, if had any of those women come to me one on one, I would have been, you know, it's a personality conflict or, you know, oh, you're just difficult or it's just this one situation. It's the exception. Right. And but seeing them one after the other, he's it's so powerful to him. He tr- describes it like one of his biggest scientific epiphanies. He's like, oh my god. Um, and he, but he also thinks like, oh wow, I never had to. None of these women have children. Um, and he's like, I never had to think about. He has four kids. He never had to think like, if I have children, will I give up my career? Um, so I do think like men can, and then he becomes a real ally. And I do think men can be allies, or you know, the people in power can be allies. Doesn't always work. One thing that the women that I think is interesting about the women is some of them want this, they want a committee to look at the resources for men and women. And some of them want a committee that's made up totally of women. And the other women are, and the dean are like, no, 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 you can't do that because mm-hmm. we need people in power to do this. So they put men on the committee. And in fact, those men do make a difference. It's infuriating that it has to be that way, but it's sort of, again, reality. Yeah. I think that what's interesting about the situation that we're looking at now is that, you know, there are voices that are filling the void for our boys, you know, too, you know, like these 
Pete, Jordan Peterson and Nate, what are, what's the other guy's Andrew name? Tate. Andrew Tate. Andrew Tate. And it's like, <laughs> I mean, it's, it, this is, this is a problem in that, you know, we, who is like going to fill that void for them when they're, they're going backwards in, yep. you know, the progress. And I don't know how or what to do. We both have boys yeah. and they are exposed to this and we have to have these conversations with them and explain to them, you know, how, how do you go about um, talking to your, your sons about this? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, well, two things. One, when I was reporting this book shortly after shortly after shutdown, we were trying to you know find a movie to watch, and so I was like, "Oh, you guys have never seen Goodwill Hunting," and I'm writing this book about MIT. Perfect. So Fritz had just, my older son had just turned 13. And so we come to that scene where Will is swabbing, you know, he's a janitor and he's swabbing. Yes. He sees this equation on the board that nobody can solve and he like quickly solves it. And that's the moment we realize he's a genius. And my son, who's 13, looks at it, and who was 13, looks at it and says, wow, he's Nancy smart. Like, so he like in, just instinctively was like, oh, women can be geniuses. But now he's 16, right? And so, and I do hear him speaking differently. And so I ah. find it really hard because now I've become the scold and they will make, like, they'll talk about, you know, Andrew Tate being railroaded or whatever. It's just like, oh God, you exactly. know. Exactly. It's like, why are you, def- where, what I happened? Know. Like, I know. Is that, so is that I, a puberty I, thing? Like I, also? I Mormons? Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean. Because I, I, I have three girls, so I, I don't have Yeah, that. no, I think, um, I think it is, I think it's the culture and I think it's, um, I think it's also the, the, the culture now, not only is there some misogyny there, but there's also this anti-wokeism, right? So yes. people don't like to be told that they're thinking or doing something wrong. So we have now hammered this unconscious bias thing into people so much that they're like, don't tell me that. Stop telling me I'm racist. Stop telling me I'm yeah. sexist. I'm not. And they're going to like... So now they're looking for ways that people are, and I do think, I think this is partly a Me Too backlash, you know, Mm -hmm. that men were quote unquote canceled and didn't deserve it. And I think, so yeah, I mean, I I think, I don't know. It's tricky. It's it's really hard. But so what I try to do with my boys is I try, I try very hard to listen to their language because I loved it when my son thought that like this genius was Nancy Mm -hmm. Smart. That was really striking to me. Now it's like when I hear him talking about women or about girls and just kind of the role the girls have and, you know, especially around dating and stuff. I try to sort of put a different perspective on it. Like, well, think of her perspective. And is that the right word to use? Would you use that? I mean, it's such a simple thought mm-hmm. experiment. Would you say that about a, a boy? Would you say that, right? What like, yeah, the turn the tables just quickly. Um, I think that can be really helpful, but I will say, I feel like a real scold. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can imagine. I can imagine. I, I don't know. Also, you know, I've my <laughs> girls would definitely say that I get super heated when yeah. I'm talking about any sort of injustice anywhere. And yeah. I I can get o- over the top with my intensity. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're like, Mom, we're activists as well. Like, you don't have to reiterate this because they obviously they're young. They're still in school. One's going to college next year. I'm like, wait till she sees yeah. a lot of things that she doesn't see in this little bubble here in yeah. our town. But um, I can I hate feeling like the you know repetitive scold, like you said, yeah. or always trying to illuminate a conversation that they had that they don't feel like having illuminated yeah. all the time. I also think that um, that we've become so. Um, I don't know, atomized almost, right? So like everybody, I think the identity politics do drive people crazy. So it's like, we have women here and then we have black women and then we have, you know, Latina and all these groups are being pitted against each other. And again, that's why I thought there's part of the book where I taught all the women at MIT, the 16 women at MIT were all white because there were no women of color. Of course, right. In the in the 90s, um, which is not so long ago. Um, no. But um, but there is I do describe this group of women who came together in the 70s, which were that, you know, different um, ethnicities and races to talk about what they call the double bind. So the problem of being a minority and female in science. Um, but what's so interesting to me about that meeting that produces the report on the double bind is that, you know, you had groups of black women and Asian women and uh, Native American women. And they're all like they're they were atomized, too. And they're all looking at each other and thinking, well, they have it better because X or they have it. And, I think like the more commonality and we can find um, the better. I mean, I, again, yeah. it's all seem like such small things. It's like, it's just compassion. It's just, you know, sort of trying to put yourself in somebody else's shoes, 100%. but we've just, 
I think we've come out of pandemic really um, having lost that or, or worn down our ability and our willingness to do that. Well, also telling the girl, our sons and daughters that like if they work together, yeah, I mean, that that's the whole thing, too. You know, like you were saying before, it's not a zero sum game. Like yeah. our country loves to present itself <laughs> as a zero sum game yeah. because it had been. It's basically this whole new integration of letting everybody have a chance yeah. and and actually helping them have a chance. You know, I once heard Gloria Steinem say that she um, she made a point of always taking a, a black woman to her events. Right. Like so mm-hmm. she, because right. she recognized the intersectionality. Um, and part of me wants to say to like, and I can't do this because I, but I go to my book events and part of me wants to say like, okay, if I like to the next book, when you go to another book, uh, you know, book event about a book on women, like bring, bring your husband, bring, bring your husband. Yeah. And to that point, I was curious about this question is when you get questions from men versus women in your book readings, is it a different type of question that comes from the man versus, I mean, are, are they... I mean, because I feel like there may be a little more, you know, I was just curious if it's different. I would say, I'm just thinking back, I did an event um, at the library in the town where my parents lived in Connecticut on Saturday. And there was a man there who was a scientist um, and he was very much an ally. I think, that, and I think his question does go to what men ask. Um, they, I think they're kind of surprised that the women put up with this. And they're like, why, why did she put up with this? It's like, because we're raised to be nice or raised not to be difficult. Um, so I think that that is part of it. Um, but there was also a man in that audience who I know who, who's a professor or a retired professor. And he was sort of shaped. It was funny because the, his, I guess, girlfriend, I don't know if you described it that age, but, um, she said to me, Oh, great book. But he was kind of shaking his head as if to say, like, I, I was painting too bleak or that, that I was, I was talking about the administration at MIT and he was sort of shaking his head. Like I didn't understand it. And I thought, Oh no, I'm not, I'm not sure you understand it. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. 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 I think that throughout the book, you do see a lot of people that I would imagine reading this book are embarrassed a little about how they are, how they were and what the things that they, that they didn't realize. So what's been kind of great for me is that I, you know, I did interview, it was very important to Nancy that I interview all the men and get their side of the story, right? She did not, like, these are men, she's, some of them are very prominent in her field, Mm -hmm. biology. Um, They're men she worked with, some of them have been friends with her, of hers for 50 years. Um, So I did talk to them. And so, you know, for instance, there's one who is, continues to fight back and say like, no, that, you know, try to find all the reasons that what I wrote was not. Mm-hmm. really reflect the natural, natural picture. Um, but one of them who she has quite a con- one of her biggest conflicts with said to me, you know, well, we all grew up like, we, so he, you know, and he was like, yeah, I, cause I called, I had to call and read him the convert. Like there's a very difficult conversation they have. And I called and I read him her, what the version that she had recorded at the time. And, you know, do you agree with that? And he didn't dispute it. And then he said, you know, you're going to, he said, you're going to write the book that you're going to write. And that's fine. He said, one thing, just please promise me you won't discourage young women from going into science. Mm -hmm. So he, um, he read the book and he thanked me and he came to, he actually came to an event to thank me. And he was like, because you, you, you know, you promised that you wouldn't do this and you didn't like your book really encourages women to go into science. Yeah. He's his feeling again, he said, we all grew up and he read the book and said that it was an accurate description. I think these men have learned. And then I talked to his wife, which was also interesting, but, and she said about the other guy, like, oh, he still doesn't get it. But like, <laughs> I think these men have learned. I think this mm-hmm. is, I think that's where the unconscious part comes in, right? Like they didn't set out to make, you know, to discriminate against women, but they were super aggressive in their own careers right? And at the cost of women. They were working within the system, which disadvantaged women. Right. And right. I think that that's the thing is that they were just doing as they had learned. And it's what the system, there had been no other framework to everybody plays to the role we've given them men and women. Yeah. And that's the thing going forward is how do we, you know, we must try to change the foundational framework of which all Mm -hmm. of our young men and women are working from. Because I mean, in some instances, the United States is way ahead. You know, you know, I come from a Middle Eastern culture and, you know, my position in have I been, I always thought I was like, I had a great advantage, you know, I was like, from just from my mother's experience, like she couldn't go to, she was like locked out of higher education. Like that didn't happen to me. I must be, I must have it great, you know? Yeah. I mean, Kate, you know, through being, uh, having my own business and working for 25 years in media, uh, I, have seen so many times a chance to apply for a women owned or women grant or, and I will never do it. 
<laughs> and because of this mindset that I had, I'm like, you know, I don't need assistance, you right. know, you know, right. it's, it's a very strange, it's, and mm. that's what I mean by these subtleties that you don't realize you yourself are limiting yourself or doing yeah. something that you are unaware of, you know, for your own, because yeah. of your society. And you know, everywhere I go, people ask me what they can do, like what young, what my, my advice to young women would be. And that is part of it. It's just like, take yourself seriously, right? Like we know that women don't, women with equal experiences, man, if you have a woman and a man with equal experience and there's a job posting, the man right. is going to apply for the job and the woman's going to be like, oh, I'm not really sure I have the experience. Yeah, or I'm not ready yet. I, yeah, I'm not ready yet. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Like they work a little harder. 100, I, I, I did the same thing totally in my career. Well, you know how the, I remember reading something about women have a tendency to say, I'm just, yeah, I'm yes. just doing, you know, there's so many of these subtle, or I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to bother you. Uh-huh. you know, there's so many of yeah. these things that you just have, and it, it's an indication of your underlying feeling about your, you're bothering yeah. someone, you know, you're not yeah. important. I'm taking up room here. Like one of the, one of the lines that really resonated with me from this report that the women did in 1999 was there's some line about, you know, they felt tolerated, not welcomed. It's like, that's, you know, oh, you're yes. just, you're just here, just taking up a tiny bit of space. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, yeah, you know, one story that I tell people, I think, I think Jeanette, you heard me say this, um, mm-hmm. uh, uh, that Nancy, when I first, so I've known Nancy now for almost 25 years, but yeah. we, we were speaking almost every day when I first started doing the book five years ago. What the first thing people notice about her is that she has a slight British accent because her grandmother she grew up <laughs> yeah. she grew up in New York City, but her grandmother was English and the grandmother lived in the same building. Um, so Nancy was saying brilliant a lot, and I was like, oh, is that you know the way British people say brilliant? Like you know your soup is brilliant, whatever. So I asked her about it, and she's like, no, 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 no. I just noticed that nobody ever uses the word brilliant to describe these women. They're always talking about brilliant men. So I just decided I was going to talk about brilliant women, and I was like. That's brilliant. <laughs> so I just want to be like, you're brilliant. Like, why, why not? And I love that story. I, I, you, I love that story. And when I texted you that I finished the book, I wrote incredible. And I was like, I should have said brilliant. <laughs> I remember thinking it. I was like, no, yeah. brilliant. You're so conditioned to not say that, that it's even hard for you in a text, even after you know the story. <laughs> this is a thing that brilliant people live in New Jersey, right? <laughs> You like my transition? Brilliant that? women. Live that was in a New brilliant Jersey. transition. Jeanette. Yes. Why did you end up here in in Montclair? How did you? And how long have you been here? So I've been here for sixteen years. We moved here two weeks before my older son was born. Yeah. Um, and in that two weeks, twice. No, sorry. In the next month, we twice had flooded basements, eighteen inches of water. Of course. Water. Yes. I, I don't know why that. we stayed, but no. Um. <laughs> we moved here because we were living in the city, you know, like the common story. Um, and my husband had taken a job at a, uh, he was in a hospital, he works at a hospital, he was an oncologist at a hospital in New York at Mount Sinai. And he had taken a job working for a company in Branchburg, New Jersey, a biotech company um, that did cancer drugs. So he was making this reverse commute and I was having the whole like nesting thing. Was, anyway, so it was a combination of that, but it was really like, he, the the idea that he would drive from New York City and then back every day was just there was no easy way to take a train to where he was going. So we moved out here and I was um for like, I don't know, I'm trying to think for almost my entire pregnancy, I was commuting to Washington, D.C. to cover. I was covering. Oh, um, a lot. What is that? So I remember, That's four hours, right? Four hours. Uh, well, not every day. So it was, I would, I would go down on Sunday nights or Monday mornings and come back Friday afternoons because mm-hmm. I was covering Capitol Hill and pretty much there's not much, there's not a lot that happens there on Friday. So I could come back on Friday afternoons and uh, like all my, you know, my doctors and stuff were in New York. But um, I remember I was sitting in the Senate press gallery at my desk and looking at houses in New Jersey. And I saw a house in Maple that I liked and a house in New- in Montclair that I liked. The house in Maple would sold. We came out to look at the house in, in Montclair. Um, we looked at some other houses. There wasn't a lot on the market and the house that I had seen ended up being the house that we bought. We had some friends. My husband had friends from college who lived in Montclair, and I, you know, I work for the New York Times. It is often it's, joked that like half the New York Times lives there, so it wasn't a, it wasn't like a radical move. Um, but uh, but I grew up in Connecticut, and I think there's like a total snobbery, and you know, like Connecticut, New York, like New Jersey. You know, who wants to live there? It's whatever. <laughs> Suddenly, I'm living in New Jersey. But yeah, we've and so we've stayed. My husband has. Um, he now works for a company that's, that has offices in New Jersey and uh, and New York City, but we've we've stayed. So 
that's how we so are. so have you convinced the people in Connecticut that it's you know no you can't convince people from Connecticut that yeah Jersey's right awesome. yeah I know, I know. <laughs> uh huh uh huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> But no, I'm, I'm, we're really, we're, we've been really happy here. And I covered, so then I ended up covering, I ended up covering New Jersey for the New York Times, which was yeah. a super fun beat. And I will tell you, yes, Montclair is full of brilliant people, but also like the whole state is kind of brilliant, I would say. And I mean, I won't say, but it's just, there's so much diversity here. People yeah. would think like, uh, like the way the New York Times looked at New Jersey was always like from New York, their perspective was, oh, it's just, it's the tri-state area, Connecticut, New Jersey. It's all the same as New York City. It is incredible just the like north south of New Jersey is so different, right? Yes. But just the different attitudes you get just by crossing the bridge is really quite incredible. Um, mm -hmm. Bridge or tunnel, I should say. Um, and there's just like, I, there were so many, I just had such a diversity of stories. M much of my time covering New Jersey was spent covering Bridgegate, which was- Yes, I was going to bring that up and ask you about that. Yeah, that was, huge, but, there was, but there was also so much. I mean, there was like, I just had such a wealth of stories and met so many interesting people. And it's, it's sort of this wonderful, like, yes, there's this great diversity, but there's also, um, you know, it's the most densely populated state in the nation. And, um, but it's also, it also can feel like a small town, which I remember from my days reporting in Boston, it felt the same way. Like there was, you can, you pretty quickly discover that a lot of people know each other. Um, and so that's kind of, that's always fun too the New Jersey story, do you think that that would have happened or you would have been that involved in it if you hadn't lived in New Jersey or what is, we just don't know. Um, I think that covering New Jersey, it was, it was better that I lived here covering New Jersey. So yeah. I used to joke, like I remember going, this is when there was still a New York sports club in, in Montclair. And I joke, I remember joking to an editor, like I'm going to expense my gym membership because like I would go to the gym and I would run into people who were involved in the story. And I would get like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, I would go get coffee and I would bump into someone else. Like it was just kind of, I mean, like going to, you know, Raymond's right for dinner. And I would be like, Oh, now suddenly I'm standing next to like a lawyer who is, you know, who's involved in this. And I'm so it just, yeah. I mean, it just felt like I definitely picked up more just by living here. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I think a lot of us I've discovered is that living in New Jersey, you, when you leave New York city, especially mm. you think I'm, I'm going to give up all my, you know, connections, my dreams yeah. that, that, who, <laughs> who I can work with, but it actually expands exponentially when you move yes. out here. It's really fascinating because you're in a smaller community of people that are all going there. You're not in this massive, huge, yeah. you know, situation. You're just like, Oh, we go to take yeah. As I know you, right? Yeah. I just, I always say like, I would, Montclair would be perfect if there were a subway that ran every three minutes, right? Because that's that's my only thing. Like, I wish we could get into the city easier, but that's, you know. Well, Rachel, do you have any questions? Well, I, I wanted to ask, because you did such an incredible job of not only understanding all the science, but then regurgitating it in a way that <laughs> yes. was good and easy to understand um, for people not in the field. How did you grow up that you had this love of learning all different topics in order to be a journalist? Like you yeah. said, you really do have to do a deep dive um, into a totally different landscape and then be yeah. able to not only understand it, metabolize it, but then present it back to the masses in a way that they can understand. Yeah. I mean, I would say, you know, people are always saying, oh, your father was a scientist, did that, you know, is that why you can do this? Um, certainly. So my dad was a physicist, which does not mean, I will say that, that there's, there's no reason that understanding physics should make you be able to explain molecular biology. So right. My dad was a physicist too. So right? oh, yes, cool. electrophysicist. Oh, wow. Very <laughs> cool. Um, yeah. My dad worked in the semiconductor industry. Um, where I think the, that family interest is important is that like, you know, there's, there's sort of a perpetual curiosity to scientists. Right. Mm -hmm. And so there, there are two things that I would say, you know, for my mom, I definitely got, you know, my mom, as you said, your mom, like broke glass ceilings. It was sort of expected of me that I would do something like that, that I would do something important. Um, my parents were very involved. Like they were always involved on like boards and commissions and like various civic things. Um, one of my earliest memories is my dad who was from Holland became a U.S. citizen because as he said, like, he wanted to be able to vote against Richard Nixon and he couldn't get it in time, but it like <laughs> started him. His Watergate just infuriated them. So he had sort of the scientific curiosity, um, but his family was also like, they were really, they were definitely a family of storytellers. Um, and so my dad would tell us these stories. He had grown up in Nazi occupied Holland and he would tell us these stories and my brothers and I would just like hang on it. Cause it's so, it was so literally foreign to us. 
Um, and it's kind of magical. You know, I always think there's this poem, it's a it's a W.H. Auden poem called Musée de Beaux-Arts. And he talks about, he talks about this Bruegel painting, right? And like how so much is happening. Like there's this, you know, Icarus is flying too close to the sun, but in a little corner, like the doggy scratching his rear end. And yeah. <laughs> that was always like, the, what I loved about my dad's stories was that like, yes, there was this major thing of like the war was happening, but then it was also, you know, like he's still a kid. And what my dad remembered was like the, the one time that they got, they managed to get Get whipped cream and how sweet the whipped cream tasted, right? And how, you know, he remembers his uncle next, who lived next door um, when the Nazis were coming, he's smashing all of his wine bottles in the wine cellar because he didn't want the Nazis to get the wine. It's, so I, I loved stories, right? And so the way, but I, but my parents, so my parents really raised us with a lot of curiosity and to love words and to love language. Um, I had trouble with the science in the beginning. I was like, how am I ever going to convey this? But what I finally realized, especially there's this one early experiment that Nancy does about gene expression. And I just thought, oh, I just have to see this as a story, right? Like it's all about what's going to happen to this DNA molecule and if it's going to bind to the protein. And I just thought like, okay, you just have to think of the molecule as a character. And that's like, that was how I ultimately, I was working with with Nancy's um, PhD advisor on the story. And he was trying to sort of like help me understand it and explain it. And there was one point where he was like, no. <laughs> and then when I got, when I started thinking about it as a story and I wrote it that way, he's like, yes, you got it. So I think that's what made the difference for me. It, that mm -hmm. comes through in your writing, yeah. the small little details when she hears Larry Summers. And mm -hmm. you were, you told the story in this podcast a minute ago, yeah. but uh, about what happened, but there's a moment you that I hung on is that when she was listening to him, she stood up, but she stood up and waited for a yeah. few, for a little bit to make sure that every, and just that little detail mm -hmm. stuck with me about what you need to, you know, how you, it changed the whole story. Instead mm -hmm. of she just stood up and walked out, you know, right. she stood up and waited and you got into the scene more the way. Right. Like she's story. not, she's not, she wasn't just going to the bathroom. She wanted to yes. make sure that he knew she was leaving for a reason. This yeah. is a, her way of resisting mm -hmm. and letting everyone see that. And that. there's so much of that throughout the book of these little, little moments where you just stop and you really feel like you're there in the scene and you're yeah. in, the, and that's why I think it's a remarkable book. Thank Everyone you. should read. You're both brilliant. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kate, thank you so much for coming on and, you know, being part of this, uh, experiment that we're doing. I love being lost in New Jersey with you girls. Thank oh, you. Thanks. You Thank can come you. back anytime you oh, feel like excellent. sharing anything, breaking a story. We're here. Or your next book, which is going to go. How long do you think it's going to take? 10, five, five oh years? Oh my God. Years? I hope not that long. Are you I'm working not... on another book right now? No, I'm not working on my next book, but I'm actively thinking about what the next book would be. Cause I really did have fun writing this. There were, there were very hard moments. Um, I'm sure. But um, but it's it was a very satisfying feeling to to finally get it to a place where I felt like it was telling a story that I wanted to be out there in the world. And you're going to be at the Montclair Literary Festival. Yes, Mar uh, May 6th. Yeah. And, and you're running an exceptions panel, an exceptional panel, exceptional, right? Exceptional women. Yeah. So it's women in journalism, women in philosophy and women in science. Yeah. Amazing. I'm looking oh, forward to going to that. All right. Thanks. Well, Thank you so much, yeah. Kate. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 This podcast is produced by Rachel Martens and Jeanette Afsharian. Please follow us on Facebook and Instagram. We hope you share this pod with your friends and family and let us know what you think. Check out our website at lostinjersey.site. And don't forget to get lost.